Good morning and welcome to Emmanuel. And the greetings to our sanctuary and the ancient tradition to indicate Christ has entered our homes. And since this is God's house, we pray that he is very pleased to see this here too. Thanks to everyone who had a hand in, in bringing some greens for decorating and preparing for Christ's birth inside and out. The manger scene outside is amazing too. Please enjoy the tea and coffee in the foyer after service. We give a warm welcome to Pastor Terry Denbach, who once again is leading us in worship today, and we're so pleased to have both of them, Terry and your wife Donna. Teenagers, Emmanuel Teenagers held a delicious catering, catered uh, Christmas lunch this Wednesday past. There was a bountiful amount of turkey and all the trimmings. Our, and our new interim moderator, Alton Ruff, came and also introduced himself to everyone there. Special music from Wayne and Yulon was enjoyed by all. Our treasurer wants to let everybody know that our last annual meeting, we, the Congregation of Emmanuel, pledged to raise 4000 for 2023 Presbyterian sharing. To date, we have raised 4624 dollars Presbyterian World Service and Development donations have equaled $1,905, and thanks to all who have been able to donate. We are continuing to raise funds for the Christmas Mission Project to bring a new MRI machine to the General and Marine Hospital. This MRI is so vital to fast diagnose for many conditions, and we, we will save a lot of excess time and travel to other hospitals farther away. Donations may be used during your offering envelopes, just mark at Christmas Mission Project with the amount on the front of the envelope. You can also donate online, see the poster in the entranceway. Offerings will be received through to December 31st of December. Note, 2024 envelopes are available today after worship uh, in the foyer in the, in the cloakroom on a table. And any church donations submitted received before 11.59 p.m. on December 31st, 2023 in your local time zone will be eligible for a 2023 charitable tax receipt. Any donations submitted after midnight will receive a tax receipt for the year 2024. Uh, the puppets have a special treat for you today. Please pick it up from Emily in the foyer. Feel free to take extra teach, treats to share with others. And I have another announcement here, which is Evelyn Menduke, which you know is a member of our congregation, uh, asked if there are any others like her that, that weren't able to get out much and would like to start share in exchange phone calls. Please call her if you, in, if you intend to do this. She does not have computers, okay. Sorry, I'm a little left trouble reading. And these are the announcements that I have. Okay, thank you. Joy, it's something we all want, something we all need. Joy is more than happiness. It's more than a fleeting emotion. True joy comes on the other side of surrender, worship, and adoration. It's what happens when we breathe in the Bethlehem story. Joy is found in Jesus. He's the author and embodiment of it. 
So come to the manger. Come and behold this miracle over and over again. Open your hearts to the joy that this child in this story is offering. Be comforted by the familiar and lean into the unfamiliar. Set aside every urgency and every distraction and allow your heart to leap with joy. Come to the manger. Joy is here and his name is Jesus. Today we light the candle of joy. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The shepherds hear the angel's proclamation and indeed are filled with both awe and joy. They are mere shepherds, considered by some as the lowest of the low. But the angel comes to them, no one else but to them, and gives them the news of a momentous event, the birth of the Messiah. Filled with joy, they careen down the hills into the town, find the stable and the manger, and kneel before the Christ child. Joy is an emotion of exaltation that comes from a new realization, an event of blessing, a state of blessedness. And surely the shepherds feel that. But as the years progress and they tell the story to their children's children, the sense of wonder and joy remains. An angel has spoken to them. The angel spoke of a physical birth, but there is also a spiritual dimension. The joy that breaks upon us when we finally grasp that Jesus loves us in spite of ourselves, forgives all our sins and our past failings, and takes up residence in our lives. Then the initial joy melds into an enduring joy of companionship with the Lord. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the joy the angels experienced, the joy of Jesus' birth, and the joy of the new birth that we can experience day by day until we see you in glory. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're able, please stand while we sing Joy to the World, hymn number 153, and Hope for Everyone.
good singing this morning, church. That is our message, isn't it? There is hope for everyone. Amen. Well, God bless you. It's good to be with you again this morning and those watching online or will be during this week. And uh, God bless you. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning. And uh, we want to uh, uh, read our call to worship, and it's taken from Isaiah chapter 61. And I'm going to be reading verses 1 through 4 and then verse 10 and 11. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Let me read those three words again. To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that that have been devastated for generations. Verse 10 and 11. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom adores, adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For the soil makes the sprout come up and, out, and a garden causes seeds to grow. So the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise sing up before all nations. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to his word this morning. And uh, if you'd just bow your heads with me this morning as we go before him in prayer. Lord, we do thank you. Lord, we give you glory and honor. Lord, on this third Sunday of Advent, Lord, we celebrate joy. It is so joyful to know you. Lord, I'm so thankful that you've come into our hearts, Lord. That you came to replace, oh God, Lord, the sadness, Lord, with joy this morning and we give you glory and praise and so Lord as we gather in your presence we're reminded of your promises Lord where you sent your servant to bring good news to the oppressed to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners Lord let your spirit be upon us this morning as we seek to embody your grace and compassion in our world we pray for those among us Lord who are who are burdened down this morning, Lord, who who don't have enough joy this morning. We ask, O God, that you'd be with them. Lord, we we pray, O God, for those that are oppressed this morning. Lord, for the brokenhearted this morning, Lord, in need of healing. We pray that you would come, Lord, and minister to their hearts. And for all who yearn for freedom, Lord, may your comforting presence be their strength and be our strength. Lord, you've called us to be rebuilders of the ruins, to restore the streets to live in. Guide our hands and guide our hearts, Lord, as we work towards creating a world that reflects your love and your righteousness. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. Thank you for the promise and for the clothing, clothing us with the garments of salvation and a robe of righteousness. May our souls rejoice in you this morning as the earth brings forth its shoots and the garden causes that which is sown to spring up in it, Lord. Lord, we want to be that people that rejoice in you, that give glory to your holy name. So be with us this morning, Lord. Watch over us this morning. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through your word this morning and through the songs that are sung, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, would you pray the Lord's Prayer with me this morning? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 If you again are able to stand, we're going to be singing number 110, Come, Thou Long Expected Jesus. Well, it's great to be here again, and uh, good to see so many out this morning on this, uh, well, it's December, the middle of December, there's no snow, so it's good for travel, not so good for the ski hills, but, uh, but anyway, it's good to see each one this morning, and those that are watching online, God bless you. Um, we looked... Uh, the last couple of weeks, we've looked at Mary's response uh, to Gabriel's message to her. Uh, what a message, and what a response that she gave as she responded, yes, yes, yes to God, yes to what he was asking of her, saying yes to the birth of God's Son, saying yes to Jesus Christ. And the cost of all of that that would entail in her life. And uh, I'd like to look at, this, if you'd look with me this morning, uh, why Christ had to come. You know, as we celebrate his birth this morning, why did he have to come? I want to read from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9 this morning, as we prepare to uh, open the word of the Lord. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified. This is from Psalms 8. What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You've made him a little lower than the angels. And you crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And putting everything under them, God left nothing that is subject to them. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus. Amen. Who was made a little lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for every one. Would you bow your heads with me for a moment? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this Advent, the third Advent Sunday, Lord. 
We thank you, Lord, for each one that's here this morning and those watching online. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord, that is settled in our heart. We ask, O oh God, that you would speak to us this morning. Lord, as we rush to get to Christmas, Lord Jesus, may we remember that you love us, that you came because you love us. So be with us, Lord, as we hear your word this morning. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. In 1998, on December the 24th, George Will wrote a column, and he called that column the happiest holiday, the happiest holiday. And I want to read just a little bit of it this morning. This was uh, written to the Washington Post, and uh, he writes, a sardonic British skeptic of the late 19th century suggested that three words should be carved in stone over all church doors. Important if true. Hmm. On Christmas Eve at the end of the rarely state, stately and always arduous march that we in North America make each year to the happiest holiday, it sometimes seems that they're supposed to celebrate Christmas as though they've all agreed to forget what it means. There's several reasons why forgetting Ashley or make-believe is not altogether unfortunate. First, some people really have forgotten what Christmas means. Hmm. Or never really knew, or never cared about Christmas's religious dimension, but they still enjoy the benefits from the seasonal upsurge in, in goodwill and, and, and non-sectarian goodwill. Second, many North Americans of, of faith are assert, or that assert Christianity is mistaken about what occurred in Palestine over 2,000 years ago and in the 33 or so years thereafter. However, Christmas in North America nowadays is largely an artifact of non-sectarian figures such as Charles Dickens. How many have heard of Charles Dickens? Sure, we all have. Who poured a syrup of sentiment over the event, thereby making the fun of it accessible to everyone and offensive to only those who love taking offense. And there's a few. You know some of those. Yeah. This is one way a pluralistic nation accommodates religious differences by allowing some religious matters to be treated as desacralized bits of the common culture. I'd say they, our world in North America puts Christmas right in there. For the past 155 years, Ebenezer Scrooge and the Cratchit family have been the secular carriers of what is nowadays called, with purposeful vagueness, the Christmas spirit. Dickens, in his public readings of A Christmas Carol, would impersonate 23 different characters. <laughs> I don't know. I imagine. And, well, now listen. And until he shortened them, his readings took three hours. So, carry the four. We'll, we'll, see, we'll be done at two o'clock, if you don't mind. That's a long time. That's a long time. Victorians, the poor things, <laughs> they lacked modern electronic devices and so had to make do with such entertainment. Still, he says, it helps soften the hammer blows of the holidays. For weeks, many harried people have been feeling in P.G. Woodhouse's words that Christmas has us by the throat. Almost, but not quite, lost amid the commerce and the clatter is the astonishing idea of which John Betchman wrote, no love that in a family dwells, no caroling in frosty air, nor all the steeple-shaking bells can with this simple truth compare, that God was man in Palestine and lives today in bread and wine. Important, very important, if true. End quote. He kind of hit the nail on the head in, in, in several, several statements that he made. And uh, 
Have we really forgotten have, what Christmas, why Christ came, what Christmas is all about? Did he even have to come at all? Many Christian organizations, and I want, as I was preparing and studying, and many Christian organizations and even churches have all but forgotten why Christ came. There was a poll done by George Barna in 2003, <clears throat> and he looked at the epidemic of doctrinal illiteracy among born-again Christians. Barna reports this disturbing news. 26% believe all religions are basically equal. 26% of born-again Christians believe that you can line them all up, Muhammad, Hare Krishna, all of these, Buddha, all, and Christ, all of these religions are basically equal. I was in the hospital this week getting some therapy on my hand, and as I was leaving from Own Sound Hospital, just by the by the check-in there, there's a, there's a plaque up on the wall, a poster. And it, it's a poster, it had the golden rule in the middle of the circle. But all around the circle were, I don't know, I didn't count them, but 30 different, different religions, world religions, that give their uh, rendition of the golden rule. And Muhammad, Hare Krishna, Buddha, Jesus Christ, and it just kept going. And I'm thinking, <laughs> and I was already preparing, and I'm thinking, oh, it's true. It's true. We've all but forgotten. 50% in his poll believe that good works will get you to heaven. Somebody should have told Almighty God he wouldn't have had to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for our sins. Somebody should have sent him a memo. 35% do not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I, and we're talking about born-again believers. We're talking about church people. 50 or 45%, or 50, 35%, sorry. 35% are serving a dead Christ. A dead God. They go to church every Sunday and they worship a God who's still in the grave. 45% do not believe that Satan exists. 33% huh. accept same-sex marriages. God was mistaken when he made Adam and Eve. 38% say it's okay to live together before marriage. And I'm sure he, the list goes on. This is all that, that I've gotten off of it. One writer added to this that this is strong evidence of how North American Christianity is conforming to the dominant secular culture. It's all right to be religious according to the dictates of postmodernism as long as your faith, as long as what you believe exists only in your own head. Don't you dare open your mouth. Don't you dare speak in the public about your belief. You keep it here. Keep it locked up. Have fun. Don't speak it. As long as it believes, as long as it exists in your own head. If you start claiming that your beliefs are more than just a private mental state that makes you feel good, saying instead that what you believe is objectively real and valid for everybody. Huh. Listen, Romans 3, 23 and 24 say, For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Mary, you're going to have a baby, and his name will be called Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. Hmm.
If you start claiming that your beliefs are more than just a private mental state that makes you feel good, saying instead that what you believe is objectively real and valid for everyone, then you are an intolerant menace to society, end quote. And we see this being played out today. You know, it used to be when I, when you, when, when I was a child, when I was just a kid, going to church, most of the kids that went to school went to church at some point. Eh? I mean, we've all been there. We've all marched to Sunday school. We've all had, had, had uh, church. We've all gone to, to, uh, uh, to summer camps and so forth. But now... You are an intolerant menace to society if you open your mouth about being a born-again Christian, of knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And we see this being played out all over our world. Maybe the British skeptic had a great point when he stated that every church should put important if true over its doors. Do we believe that Jesus is still the answer today in 2023? It's coming to a close. Do we still believe that he is still the answer? Listen, if you have questions in the corners of your mind, traces of discouragement and peace you cannot find, reflections of your past seem to face you every day, this one thing I do know, that Jesus is the way. I know you've got mountains that you think you cannot climb. I know your skies, your skies are dark and you think the sun won't shine. But in case you don't know that the word of God is true, everything he's promised, he will do it for you. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Andre Crouch, above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. My son, my youngest son, is having problems. He has a metabolic disorder and, and uh, been off diet for quite a while and he's having, he's having some issues and uh, having a real hard time and I sent him the second verse the other day and, and prayed, over, prayed with him. I said, I know you've got mountains that you think you cannot climb. I know your skies are dark and you think the sun's not going to shine. But in case you don't know, the word of God is true. Everything he's promised, he will do it for you. I hope we believe that this morning. This event that we know as Christmas has changed our world. Literally, changed history. From B.C., from before Christ, to in the year of our Lord, Anno Domini, A.D. It's true, everything is different now that Jesus Christ has come. Everything. The Bible claims... That an angel visited a virgin who became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. The baby in her womb was the Son of God from heaven. God caused a heathen emperor to call for a taxation that sent Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem at the very moment when Jesus was to be born. It took them four or five days traveling. Bless her heart. There's no hotels along the way. Four or five days, either riding a donkey, something that she had to, she had to walk, that there was no donkey available for them. 90, so mi 90 or so miles that she had to travel to Bethlehem. Hmm. Prophets foretold both the virgin birth and his birth in Bethlehem hundreds of years before it happened. I've tried to find somebody that foretold me. I can't find anybody. Even my mother and father didn't know what I would be when I was born. If they had known, they probably wouldn't have had me. But anyway, that, that's, for another, that's for another time. But uh, Isaiah, or Matthew, sorry, chapter 1, verse 21 and 23, and, and, and they... And, Matthew compares it with Isaiah 7 and 14. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. 
Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means... Oh. Which means... That's better. God with us. Writing for a Jewish audience, Matthew appeals to Old Testament prophecies, and he went there early and he went there often to show his readers that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah, the descendant of David and Abraham. He begins by citing this message from Isaiah to the Judean king Ahaz 700 years earlier which was fulfilled in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Matthew parallels the name Jesus, God is salvation, with the title Emmanuel, God with us. As they both describe Mary's child, the incarnate Son of God, who would come to save their people, his people from their sins. He inquired of them, Matthew 2, verse 4 through 6, and, and, and he again compares it with Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. He inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And he told them, in Bethlehem of Judah, Judea. For as, as, as it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for, for from you shall come a ruler." who will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew's next batch of prophetic quotes is tied to the relationship between Herod, the Roman-appointed king, and the Messiah, who would be the true king of Israel. Disturbed by the idea of being replaced, Herod wanted to know where the Messiah was going to be born. Where is he? Tell me where he's going to be. We're we're excited. Where is he going to be? The location Bethlehem was no secret. It was an open secret, having been predicted by the prophet Micah, a contemporary of Isaiah. But Micah offered further details that would have given Herod pause if he had had read them. The Messiah had existed since before ancient times, and he would be king and shepherd his people, ruling the whole earth in the name and the majesty of Almighty God. Hmm. A star led the magi, or the wise men, from the east, and it led them directly over the house in Bethlehem where Jesus was. Angels spoke to the shepherds. An angel spoke to Joseph three different times. An angel spoke to the magi, warning them to stay clear of Herod. Stay away from him. He's bad news. Even the slaughter by Herod of the baby boys of Bethlehem was fulfilled, has fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. Jeremiah chapter 31. Matthew writes in in Matthew 2, 17 and 18. Then was fulfilled that was spoken, that which was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her, her, child, her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. What a terrible time that would have been. Not all prophecies are pleasant. Not even Messianic prophecies. Herod, furious after being <laughs> thwarted by the Magi and intent on killing the newborn king, orders the slaughter of every male child under the age of two. Can you imagine? In and around Bethlehem. The words of Jeremiah, aptly known as the weeping prophet, not only provides a fitting epitaph to his dreadful episode, but they also illustrate the darkness that's present in our world. But here's the good news. Jesus came as the light of the world. The coming Savior shines Brighter than the darkness. Amen. When Simeon held baby Jesus in his arms, he prophesied of, his, of many, many things. In uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 28 through 32, and he compares it with Isaiah 9, verses 1 and 2, 
Isaiah 42, verses 1, and 7, 1 through 7, and Isaiah 49, verse 5 through 6. Listen, he says, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God, and he said, Lord, now, let, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people, Israel. Luke continues the theme of this light, this messianic light through the words of Simeon, an old man who witnesses the presentation of Jesus at the temple. Simeon recognizes the child as the Messiah, the one who would bring light and salvation to both Jews and to Gentiles, echoing several prophecies found in Isaiah. One of those prophecies speaks of the Jewish tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali as Galilee of the Gentiles and the land where Jesus would begin his ministry. It's no coincidence that Luke inserts Anna the prophetess here, noting that she was from Asher. She was from one of those tribes that were further removed from Jerusalem, and they were further removed both geographically and they were removed spiritually. They had fallen away. The message was unmistakable. Messiah has come. Jesus has come with salvation, not only to Israel, but to the remotest parts of the earth. And we have but to look, and we see the revivals that are breaking out and have broken out in Iran and Iraq. You think, how can that happen? Because God is sovereign. Because Jesus is alive. He loves people. In Iran and Iraq and China, China of all places, have a revival breaking. It's going on, and house churches being set up in Africa, in Sudan, in Russia, and the list goes on and on and on to the remotest parts of the earth. He was given many names, and all of them have a rich meaning to his followers. Wonderful counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Jesus Savior. This is where you get to participate. Emmanuel. That's quite a title, you know. What church do you go to? God's with us. <laughs> what, which one? Oh, God's with us. Really? Yeah, God's with us. Son of the Most High, Christ the Lord. And he came to save his people from their sins. He will reign from David's throne in Jerusalem, and of his kingdom it will never end. I hope you listened and heard all of these titles and all that he has and will accomplish. Let me close by borrowing a a verse of a Christmas carol that we're going to be singing here shortly by Charles Wesley. It says, Veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. Hail the incarnate deity. Pleased as man with men to dwell. Jesus, our Emmanuel. Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Important if true. I can't think of anything more important today than that truth. Jesus came. He came for us. He came to save us from our sins. Amen. Would you stand with me if you're able as we sing Hark the Herald.
Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Praise the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me this morning as we go before the Lord in prayer? Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you this morning, Lord, for sending your son, Jesus Christ. As we're about to celebrate his birth, Lord, may we receive him as our Lord and Savior. May we reach out by faith, Lord, and receive him into our hearts and serve him, live for him, and follow him all the days of our life. Lord, it's so good. It is so good to be home in your heart, Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you would speak to every heart here this morning, everyone watching, Lord Jesus, or that this Christmas, this Christmas, may be the best one yet, Lord, for many people as they come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you this morning for all that you do for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the answered prayers. Lord, we pray. Lord, for all of those, Lord Jesus, who are still in need of prayer, Lord, who are under the weather, Lord, who have, have uh, issues, O oh Lord, and, and health issues, Lord, we pray this morning, Lord, that you would reach down, O oh Lord, with your mercy and your grace and your power, Lord, and touch them. Lord, that you would come, O oh Lord Jesus, and Lord, and, and, and free whatever the problems are in their lives, O oh God, that you would bring them freedom, Lord, and bring them joy, and bring them peace, and bring them health in Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the many times that you have touched us, Lord, that you promised that you would walk with us, Lord, that you would never be far away from us. And so, Lord, this morning we ask that you would touch your people. Each and every one, O oh God, we pray in Jesus' name that you would heal and deliver and set free. Lord, those that are looking for work, Lord, those that are having other issues, Lord Jesus, that you would intervene, that you would give them direction, O oh Lord, in their lives, we ask in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for everything that's happening here at Emmanuel, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord God, for, the, for those that are, are the, uh, Lord, the... the <laughs> Those that are looking after, Lord, the business of the church, we pray, O oh God, Lord, the session, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would guide them and lead them and direct them, Lord. We pray, O oh God, that they would walk in unity, Lord Jesus, as they march forward into the future, Lord, into this new year, O oh God, Lord, that you would give them strength, Lord. Lord Jesus, that you would walk with the, the, the members, Lord, as they step forward, Lord Jesus, into a new year, O oh God. Be with us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Give us purpose and direction, we pray in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you would just bless each and every one, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the offering this morning, Lord, that offering that has been given, Lord Jesus, that you would multiply it, Lord, that it would meet the needs of this congregation and beyond, Lord. We thank you for the offerings that were raised. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that we're able to give, Lord, and we ask, oh, Lord, that, it would, that you would receive them, Lord, that it would bless you, Lord, that it would bless your people, Lord, that it would be used, oh, God, Lord, to, to help people to find Jesus Christ in this world. We ask in Jesus' precious name, amen, amen, amen.
for our last song we're going to sing. And I forgot I have two more hours yet. Um, maybe we'll maybe we'll postpone it till next week. Is that our last song we're going to sing? Is sing we the song of Emmanuel? If you're able, to, if you can stand this morning. Tell the world, his name is Jesus. Just as we close, uh, don't forget, if, you, if you're able to stay, there's coffee in the foyer, and we'd love to have you come in, or, or to stay and have some fellowship. So, uh, This is the benediction that we've been praying for the last few weeks, and uh, I'd like to pray it again. You, may you be filled with the wonder of Mary, and the obedience of Joseph, the joy of the angels, and the eagerness of the shepherds, the determination of the magi, and the peace of the Christ child. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen.
ever going to see the King soon and very soon we're going to see the King see the king.